we've been working on the LifeM project now, which is a large-scale data linking project. Um, I want to share with you some of the things that we've been learning over the first two years of this project. Um, and so the title of, of, of the talk is How Well um, Does automatic, um, Automated Linking Perform? Um, and I should preface that saying in historical U.S samples, that's going to be really important here, um, and we draw some of the lessons we draw from this analysis for modern practice, and I should acknowledge that this is joint work, like Joe, um, joint work with a lot of co-authors and a very, very large team at Michigan, including Connor Cole, Morgan Henderson, and Catherine Massey, who's here today. So let me see if this works. Okay, great. So Joe did a fantastic job of setting this up. Some of the most interesting questions um, for economic historians, but I think economists um, more broadly are very dynamic in nature. So how has the human experience evolved and why? What factors have interacted to improve well-being or hold back economic development? What have been the long-run effects of a variety of things? Some of the things I'm really interested in, you can think about policies, innovations, environmental factors, public health efforts. Joe previewed a lot of the really exciting work that's happening in these areas. Um, so one of the things that's motivated, I think, um, a lot of the record linkage that's happened is the need for dynamic data. So these questions relate to changes for individuals, um, their lives over time. Um, but until recently, most of the data we had in the U.S., especially historical data, large-scale historical data, was cross-sectional in nature, individuals at one point in time. And so very recently, there's been this huge amount of data that's come online that is starting to uh, revolutionize the types of questions we can ask and answer. Um, this includes the 1940 full count census, which contains a lot of outcomes that economists are really interested in, like wages and education. You can think about the 1850 to 1830 IPMs linked historical samples. These have all been linked to the 1980 full count. And a lot of the links, so Joe talked a little bit about this too, links for these historical data is now becoming possible through a big project called ALIRA, um, where the Census Bureau is teaming up with Minnesota. Um, the CLIP project um, is at the Census Bureau and the American Opportunity uh, study as well. So all of these things are coming online, and these are just opening up new possibilities that we simply haven't had to ask questions we haven't even been able to ask before um, and make some serious progress on answering them. I also think that the Life M project is, I think, relative to these bigger initiatives, pretty small, but we are still linking millions of vital records from births, marriages, and deaths to census data. Um, we expect this to be coming um, public data set available for everybody here around 2020, um, if everything goes as planned. Um, so all of these new data infrastructure projects, including a lot of the ones that many of you are working on in this room, are really revolutionizing what we can do. But the new, and, and Joe previewed um, this as well, so these new data require a lot of new tools, tools that we didn't need when we were in graduate school. The management of very large and very complex data require a lot of database infrastructure, things that, that we didn't need when I was in graduate school, um, tools to link new data, and theoretical and econometric tools to use these data wisely. So what does it mean to be statistically significant when you're working with data this large? We need a lot of theory to think about what hypotheses should we even be generating and how can we test them well. And the other thing is when we're doing a lot of this linking, this is going to generate a lot of error as part of the data that we have, and so we need a lot of new econometric tools to think about the ways that we should deal with that error within the context of a particular inference problem. So what I'd like to tell you a little bit about today is an overview of historical linking methods, sort of what's out there, what have we been doing, and I'm going to try to put this in a common framework so we can kind of talk about um, where, we, where we started um, and then also kind of where the literature's gone since then. And then I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what we've learned about the performance of those different linking algorithms in four, using four different criteria. So we'll report match and representativeness, which is very common in the historical literature, but to those two criteria, we'll add type 1 error rates. You can think about false positive, false links, that is linking Martha to not Martha and other data, and also type 2 errors, that is not being unable to find links for particular <coughs> individuals, which has, of course, implications for the representativeness of our samples and our ability to study certain subgroups that we may be really interested in. And so 
in the interest of thinking not just about so errors or errors, but, but how much do they really matter for a particular inference problem? This is, it's really hard to think of one inference problem that's gonna generalize to everything. We're gonna choose a particular, we're gonna use a particular case study to talk about today, which is um, intergenerational um, mobility. And we're gonna think about that for the 1940s to kind of frame this discussion and think about what can go wrong in this particular context. And finally, I wanna conc conclude the goal of the talk is, is like Joe's uh, uh, lecture, to provide some constructive suggestions for modern practice about what we can do um, to improve things. So let's start with a question. Um, measuring intergenerational mobility around 1940. This is a standard regression equation. On the left-hand side, you have log of a son's income. On the right-hand side, the key independent variable um, is a log of a father's income. And so pi here is interpreted as the intergenerational earnings elasticity. So the larger pi is, the more persistent is social class. That's the idea. The more persistent, perhaps, is an underclass. And we also generally think the less equal is economic opportunity. So 1 minus pi is the opposite. It's interpreted as the intergenerational mobility coefficient. So there's a very large literature looking at intergenerational mobility estimates and interest in this topic has really increased in recent, um, I guess in the recent decade because income inequality has been soaring in the United States, which begs the question, right? Is this sort of limiting economic opportunity in key ways? Well, one of the one important perspective on a question like that now is what was this parameter like, say, earlier in the 20th century when the income distribution was much more compressed? We might want to do something like compare intergenerational earnings elasticities for the current period to previous periods. So history really provides um, an important context for interpreting that in the present. But as you can see from this very simple regression model, it looks simple enough. But what you need for this are um, two uh, uh, income measured for two generations, a father and a son. And so the only way you're going to get that, for if you're measuring them as adults, say out of the 1940 census, is to link data. And so from this very simple regression specification, we get two records that look a lot messier. On the right-hand side, you see 1940 census data, which is handwritten. And on the left-hand side, you see birth certificate, which we're using for the life and project. And the idea is if we have the birth certificate is the key link between father and son for our project. So we have fathers and sons observed on the same birth certificate, and we can link them both forward, say, to the 1940 census, where we could pick up um, wages for non-farmers at least. There are lots of issues when we do this. Um, misreports by individuals, um, transcription errors, errors in enumeration, all sorts of things can go wrong when you're, type, you're tra trying to transition from records that look like this to the digitized versions that we can use um, in our analyses. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about the process that a lot of the historical record algorithms have used, kind of sort some of those things out. And I'm going to focus on the context of linking to U.S. Census data. Um, that's important because in, night, um, in the U.S. Census data, we have three main types of a sort of record features that allows us to identify people. We have their birthplace, we have their name, and we have their age. So if you think about a standard matching problem um, in census linking, you would search within a certain birthplace. So let's say the state of Ohio for boys that have a similar name and a similar age to say, and I hope you don't mind this price, I'm gonna call you out and use you as an example here, to price fish back. Maybe it's not Ohio, it's Kentucky, right? So we'd be searching within this, so for everyone born in 1940, in the, uh, so, uh, and we, so when we see people in 1940, not you're not that old, it's an older version of Price. Um, so we'd be looking for people in the 1940 census um, with similarity to Price Fishback in name and age and within a given birth state. And so as we move in that direction, um, the quality of the name similarity, those strings, the, the name similarity it tends to is improving. So we're increasing um, the similarity of the names as we move in that direction. As we move towards an age difference of zero, we're increasing the similarity in that dimension. Um, and in this particular case, it's very easy to find Price. That's why I thought of his name, because there are not too many people like that, right? That's a pretty unusual name. And so we get an exact unique match 
assuming that he wrote it correctly, the enumerator, uh, or he told the enumerator correctly, the enumerator wrote it down correctly, and then whoever digitized the record typed it in correctly, we'd get a match that looks just like that. Now, most historical linking um, is not this easy. Um, it's a little bit messier. We get a lot more candidate links with very similar Jarrah Winkler scores um, and a lot of uh, differences in aging. So one of the things, so Joe Ferry was really a pioneer in this literature and um, he developed a particular algorithm that I will say one of the things you should take away from my presentation that still performs very, very well. Um, he takes an uncommon name sample. He restricts the age difference to be plus or minus five he finds the exact name matches. Those are the ones over there on that frontier. And he minimizes the age difference. So in the case, if you're getting back to that exact unique match right there, that would get you back to the same thing. But you could also imagine ages that are a little, records that are a little bit further away on that age frontier, you would select those. And in the case when there are multiples, um, say there's no exact match, but there are multiples and there are ties, no match is selected. So I'm glossing over uh, a, an important point here. Um, what Joe Ferry does and what a lot of other researchers have done is use phonetic name cleaning algorithms like Soundex and Nysis. Um, these things, so Soundex was developed in the early 20th century for census linking and it reduces things that sound alike, names that sound alike, like these different versions of Smith to the same Soundex code. So here, S530. NISIS um, is another one that was developed. The New York State um, Intelligence and Identification System was introduced in the early 1970s to do the same thing as a little bit of an improvement over that, but that takes names like uh, Wilhelm and William and changes it into Wallon. And the idea here is to take strings that may have minor differences in spelling, differences in sound, and compress them to kind of a more succinct version of that information. So what that does in the scatter plot is it's taking those records and pushing more of them over to that frontier. So Joe and some other researchers use NISIS, um, I think is the favorite one um, in most cases um, in their research. So here, NISIS and SoundX can increase the number of candidate matches, which is terrific. But it can also worsen name matches if those Wilhelms and Williams are different people, if it's cleaning out what I think of as meaningful variations in names. And it can also increase problems with ties. So in all of the Wilhelms and the Williams, you may have thought of these as two different people, and if you saw those raw names, you may have selected one or the other. Now they look like ties because they're both Wallons, and so no match is selected for those records. So that's the way that this phonetic name cleaning um, can hurt. So if you fast forward a little bit, so the Abramitsky, Bustan, and Erickson algorithm relaxes a key assumption that was part of the Ferry algorithm. They try to keep common names as well. And, and their search, they're doing exactly the same search process. They're restricting the age more, so the age difference is to be plus or minus two years. They're finding the exact name matches on Nysis. And, and then they're searching iteratively to minimize the difference. Um, between the observed, the age of the primary record, and these candidates. And again, um, if there are ties, there are these multiples, no match is chosen. So the key thing that's very similar in these two methods is that they're searching along that frontier for perfect name matches or names cleaned by NISIS or Soundex. But the key here, and I don't know if you can see that very well, it's kind of a small little circle, um, is how does a record like this that has a minor transcription error or spelling difference but no age difference compare to a record that looks like this? It's a little bit further down. It's a perfect match on age, I'm sorry, on name but there's a good age gap there, a good two-year age gap. So how do we think about trade-offs between age and name similarity? Um, we're economists, we can think of a lot of ways we might model those types of things. You could come up with some snazzy functions. But that's exactly the inside of machine learning, is to take information on what humans do when they look at these records and try to model that to learn about the trade-offs between uh, these different things. Now, I've simplified things dramatically here, thinking about name similarity and age only. But in theory, you can include all sorts of record features based on name and age in your models. For instance, if you think that things are more likely to be, W's are more likely to be mistaken as M's, you 
could include that information in your machine model. You can include things like commonality score, nicest score, sound X scores, all within that model to help train this computer algorithm to do exactly what people would do if they're looking at this records. This is part of what's enabling this large-scale record linkage. And so this is exactly what IPMS does for their linked historical sa uh, samples. They're using a support vector machine to model the trade-offs in multiple dimensions. And that's exactly what James Feigenbaum does using a more, I think, economist-friendly regression-based method to model these trade-offs in multiple dimensions. So the final frontier, though, and this is the part that's really challenging because in U.S. historical census data, we don't have social security number, exact date of birth, and all sorts of other record features that we could use. We have name, age, and birthplace, really. Um, you might have sex, but that really, there's not too much extra information there after you have name. Um, so what happens here? How do we choose among ties? And so if you look at record that looks like this, these are not the Price Fishbacks. These are the John Smiths. There's tons and tons of them there. And you can also think about sort of the mass coming off of the page, that there are tons of records piled up on that exact match, that, that category there. How do you choose among those? And there's sort of, this is kind of the hardest part of what we do. And we're not talking about, I think in computer science language, about links that we can rank. It's not that one of these exact matches is better than the other. These are exact ties. We don't know which John Smith is right. They all look you know, equally good from what we can tell, at least in sort of the, the digitized census records. So this is a really big problem because these turn out to be really common in historical sam samples and sometimes more common depending on um, the types of subgroup you're interested in. So for instance, the statistics literature, the standard approach might be probabilistic weighting. So for exact ties, you're going to weight by a probability 1 over m, where m is the number of ties. There's another um, proposal by Nixon Shin that suggests random selection among ties in this particular context. Now I think a lot of historians like the first but not the second, but assuming that one of those ties is correct. Um, in both cases, the expected number of wrong links is actually identical uh, for these methods. So they perform exactly the same in large samples. I think that that's really important to know. So now let's turn to record performance. So how well do these different things do? And match rates and representativeness would be the standard criteria that would be reported in a paper because that's what we know and that's what we can test. But consider for a moment an example where I randomly link 10,000 people to another 10,000 people the match rate would be 100% and the sample would be perfectly representative. So clearly when we're thinking about working with these data, we're really concerned about the incidence of these type 1 errors, these false links. And we're also concerned about the incidence of type 2 errors because we know that we're not linking everybody and that sort of relates back uh, to this representativeness um, problem. So I want to talk about these four performance criteria. Um, in, we do in the paper, we do this in four different historical samples, but I'm going to focus on the LIFEM data and the synthetic data we created that looks like the LIFEM data for the purposes of this talk, and that's what we'll use for the intergenerational mobility estimates. So for the LIFEM data, we have a random sample of boys on bir or of birth certificates from North Carolina and Ohio for, uh, boy, well, for all children um, ages 19, uh, born from 19 to 1920, and we add in all their siblings to this as well uh, for a total sample of about 45,000 um, children, uh, or I should say boys, when you, you double that when you include the girls, but we're just going to look at the boys because the girls changed their names between birth and um, the 1940 census, so they're hard to follow. So we'll focus on the boys here. And we're going to link these individuals to the 1940 census using the birthplace, and here that's Ohio or North Carolina, um, their age and name, and we're going to pick up information on education and wages. I'll only show you information on the, the wage relationships today. Um, so just to give you a sense of what the life in process looks like, we didn't know what we were doing, so we decided to try to figure out what was the best way to link records. So we designed a process so we'd try to come up with very high quality human links. I've heard from a lot of people who've worked with, with people to do this, especially undergraduates that you can pay that they don't do the best job. So this is the way we designed the process. Um, we, every link that we had, every set of links that looks just like what I was showing you, are reviewed by two independent data trainers. And when those two independent trainers agree, we're going to count that as correct. They do make some errors, though. When there are disagreements between the two, we send that record for re-review by an additional three 
different trainers to resolve these discrepancies. And additionally, the trainers every week get audit batches, so we can give them feedback on the quality of their decisions to try to keep costs down. And we also have weekly meetings to discuss a lot of things that I think are um, relevant to what they're doing, but that they might not know. A lot of it relates to kind of the history of the records and how these things work. Um, and we have a lot of interesting discussions about women could really get married at age 14, even if that was below the age of the state law. You know, this kind of blows their mind. but. It's true. We also sent this uh, data set. We sent a sa sample of our data set off to BYU Family History Lab uh, by, by, uh, that's run by um, Joe Price, and we kind of held our breath. And we asked all these family history students to do very careful genealogical searches for these records. And the good news is, for the ones that we linked and that they linked, 96% of the time they were the same. The bad news is, of course, that the genealogists linked a lot more data than we did. I think because they're working with a lot more information than we had in the semi-automated process. So this is what the match rates look like. This is higher than what I've um, heard is the fairy constant, um, which is, I would say, kind of in the 20 to 30 percent range. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons is because we're doing this clerical review process. It's about 43 percent for the Life and Project, and this is after we've added in the North Carolina uh, data. Um, using Joe Ferry's method, and what we're going to do is we so we implement that algorithm that I described to you before, but clean without cleaning the name using any phonetic cleaning, then using the nicest to clean it, then using Soundex. And this is what I was talking about before, is the way in which these phonetic name cleanings interact with this uncommon name requirement is that they tend to reduce match rates because it's, it's increasing problems with ties. So match rates are falling there. And so these are a little bit higher than I think you might think of that are common. Um, and I will say it's also because LifeM has full names, including middle names, and exact date of birth on the birth certificate, which we think may be better than census to census linking. Now, if you relax the fairy assumption and use his algorithm to, to use the more common name samples, we can really increase match rates here. And that's exactly what we get when we use the iterative method that I, I described that um, uh, the Abramitsky et al implement. When we use um, James Feigenbaum's method, we're getting a number about 27 percent. And when we then, so what we do to implement this last one is we take, we're just using their random selection. Um, we're implementing that on top of the fairy common names samples. So what you can do here is compare that 44 percent to the 67 percent. And that tells you how much better we could do in our linking if we could simply disambiguate those ties, right? So those are the match rates. But how many of those links are wrong? So what we do is stage the equivalent of a police lineup. We take the LifeM link that we are counting as truth, the link generated by the automated method, and then we take close candidates from our probabilistic matching procedure. So candidates that the trainers would have seen, and we stage this police lineup and we send it back to the data trainers for review, and we ask them to select the correct one. And when we do that, they tell us um, that 2% of the life and links um, were wrong, and so that must have been a case when both trainers just happened to be wrong for the same record. On accident, but the vast majority are right. So that gives us a type 1 error rate of about 2%. When we do this for the ferry method, it's about 8% of links overall, but 8% divided by the match rate, the number of matches, is about 27%. So close to a third of those records, the trainers thought, were not true links. And those, uh, so you can see that the, rate, the numbers here of the share of all links, including the denominator, includes the white space. Um, fell to 6%, but the share of links, that is the 6 divided by the 19, which generates the type 1 error rate, rises as we use the phonetic name cleaning. If you move to the common name samples, we see match rates improve, but also um, error rates increase as well. <coughs> Similar for the iterative method. For the Feigenbaum method, we also link fewer and have lower um, share of uh, we have a lower share of errors, but also a lower share of records linked, contributing to about a 37 percent type 1 error rate. And for Nix and Shin, you might not be surprised when we randomly select, right, a lot of those are wrong uh, by chance. So those generate extremely high type 1 error rates. So another thing you might know 
notice, and I think this is something that's really important here, is that the type 1 error rates tend to increase when we use the phonetic name cleaning. You can see that within method for every and every data set that we've looked at. So this turns out to be pretty important. So a couple of findings, including uncommon names, increases samples, but it's also going to increase uh, um, incorrect, uh, in, uh, incorrect links. And tie, break mirror, uh, tie breaking is also going to increase your match samples, but it's also going to increase your error rates. And finally, these phonetic name cleanings. Uh, algorithms increase error rates. So I think one of the first reactions people had when we showed them this is like, listen, you trained these human reviewers, and so when you do the police lineup, you've already trained them. To, you're, they're predisposed to select the life M link because you trained them. So maybe if they're making mistakes, they're making mistakes favoring the life M thing. So this is what led us to create the synthetic data um, that Joe talked about in his lecture. So we take the same set of birth records, we subtract 15% of them to count for under enumeration and mortality for these cohorts, um, and we mess up the names and the ages a lot. So we're introducing age heaping by rounding to zeros and fives, we're inverting names, we're inverting characters, we're doing a lot, and honestly, it was really hard to knock down the match rates enough to look like what we're getting uh, from the 1940 census. And to these data, we appended men born in neighboring states that would have been roughly in the same age group, and we only appended enough so that this looks roughly like the, the same problem as we have for linking the life M boys to the 1940 census. So the advantage here is that the true link is objectively known, um, and so we can evaluate how these algorithms do for those true links keeping the people and the police lineup out of it. So for the synthetic ground truth, there are no errors um, by construction. For the ferry method, um, and using the common name samples, again, we're increasing sam uh, those match rates. They're virtually the same for the iterative method. The Feigenbaum method, I would say, completely kills it on the synthetic data set. So we have to think a little bit more about um, uh, all of the ways uh, things are going right there. And for the nixon Shin, um, uh, the match rates are much higher. But we get exactly the same pattern of error rates using these synthetic data as we did for the life M data. Um, so again, we don't think that this is something that the human reviewers are just favoring the life M project. We think that there's something very systematic about the way these data are creating errors. And we see exactly the same patterns here. I will say the one exception to what I just said is how well the Feigenbaum regression-based method performs in all the way we screwed up the data that the other algorithms aren't able to detect this regression-based method that's taking into account a variety of data features is able to identify that and correctly link things, substantially reducing um, the error rates. And I think that if we start tinkering with some of those parameters, we could, we could make this perform even better. So just to give you a sense, if you compare the error rates in our synthetic data and the life and data, they look actually quite similar across all of these different methods. I know those numbers are are, are hard to see, but you should be taking away that the bars are about the same height. And in the paper, we also look at two other ground truth samples, the Early Indicators Project um, and also the IBUMS linked historical samples. And interestingly, those are very, very different samples, but we have almost identical error rates for those between those two samples. So I summarize the, the findings um, about errors. Um, I, I will say just a few more things. So one is I don't think there's a universal error rate. I think every data set, data quality, different periods, different countries, there's lots of different things that are going on here. Um, and, I, and I think that that's important to keep in mind. But I do think it's important to point out that there are lots of errors that we seem to be baking in with the way that we're doing our linking. Um, and I will also say to the extent that the LifeM project early indicators project, IPOMS projects, have errors in there that we simply cannot identify. All of this will understate the amount of error in historical linking. The other thing that we should worry about are these missed links. And here, what we're calculating, so if once you subtract off those incorrect links, this is what we're left with across different methods. So for the life M data set, we have about 42% of all records linked. And you can look around the other ones that the variation here in the amount of links that we got correct is not nearly as great as the variation in match rates when you first looked at this would have suggested, right? So we're getting um, 
somewhere between 13% and about 30% in all of these methods. The other thing we, we looked at is to see, well, what about these type 2 errors? So as the type 2 error rates increase, so we're missing more and more links, you might be getting more and more conservative, is it the case that we're getting higher quality samples? And one of the things we discovered is that that doesn't seem to be the case either for the Life M project um, or for the synthetic ground truth. The story is a little bit different in, for the IPMs and the early indicators sample, but that's also a, a lesson to us. The things that we've been doing to increase match rate hasn't necessarily, so we've been both increasing type 1 and type 2 errors as we've progressed from sort of the fairy and then Feigenbaum thing um, over time. So the last thing I want to talk about is the implications of these errors for inference, and this is the part that Joe was alluding to. We care, of course, about the incidence of the errors. We need to care about the characteristics of the errors. But the other thing that's really important here is that the way in which these interact with a particular research problem of interest can really vary a lot. So what we're going to do is look at a specific case study, but I don't think that these results necessarily generalize. I mean, they may but they may not, so, so keep that in mind. So let's come back to our question. Measuring intergenerational mobility, we're interested in this pi, which is our intergenerational earnings elasticity, and pi is going to be, I will say, in historical context, likely smaller than the estimates you may have become accustomed to in more modern samples, because we have life cycle bias, the dads and the sons are measured at very different ages, and also there's this transitory income component that we can't average out because we don't have the PSID and multiple observations. We just have one shot in the 1940 census. What we're going to do is use a we're going to use a common set of fathers and we're going to link sons using different methods. Now this is important. When you think about that for a second, you might say, "Wait, that looks like measurement error on the left-hand side." not on the right-hand side, and you have to kind of twist around your thinking to think about this. But when I link a son to the wrong man in the 1940 census, what that means is that that man has the wrong father. So in fact, this simplifies back to the problem where you have father's income is measured with error for a given son. So it's kind of complicated to think about. So what we want you to think about is even though we think pi is going to be too small relative to the true parameter because of life cycle bias and transitory income, we want you to focus on the comparisons of these intergenerational elasticities across methods. And this is what they look like unweighted. So the life M estimate is 0.23. And the Ferry method, even though I told you that the type 1 error rate was about 25% in that sample, is identical. Um, as you move across, look across the slide this way, remember as we moved down the slide when we're looking at the type 1 error rates, those tended to increase. So for each one of those methods, as you move this way on the slide, you can also see there's a general downward trend that's consistent with as we add more of these errors into our sample that those estimates are falling. The other thing you can see is even within a given method, so the fairy method, moving from using the name, nisus, and then soundex, you see things fall pretty dramatically as well within method. Um, so you see that for each one of the methods we consider. So how important are these type 2 errors? And in particular, if you think that there are heterogeneous relationships or heterogeneous intergenerational elasticity estimates, maybe between blacks and whites or farmers and non all sorts of things like that. There are all sorts of reasons why we think that these things may vary. If you have a sample that underrepresents one of those groups, that's going to introduce um, um, some problems into your inference about the population parameter. So, one of the things that could be going on across these samples, because we know the number of true links are varying a lot, and also the people that are chosen for each one of those samples are varying a lot, is that this may just, these differences across samples may just reflect different people being chosen by the particular linking algorithm. So what we do to try and address that is we use inverse propensity score weighting to reweight the linked sample for each method to look like the population of the group we try, or to look like the sample of the group we tried to link, that random sample of boys. And in practice, this amounts to regressing um, a binary variable for whether or not the individual was linked on a set of characteristics like whether or not you have a middle name, the length of your middle name, your name commonness, number of siblings, a lot of um, characteristics that you might also include in sort of a machine learning type of model. And we use these predicted probabilities to reweight those intergenerational elasticities. 
and this is what we find. So one thing you might notice, if you can't see the numbers in the back, is that the numbers are, uh, the numbers are slightly larger. And let me toggle back and forth. This is a 0.26, and then it's a 0.23, unweighted, 0.26. So you can see that the propensity score reweighting is changing these magnitudes a little bit. It's increasing them a little bit. In general, the linked samples overrepresent high mobility individuals. So when we adjust for that, that intergenerational elasticity is going to rise. But the other thing you'll notice is that this makes fairly little difference for those patterns um, that we're seeing sort of within method, in fact, a lot of the same patterns, sort of the general downward decline and also sort of the within method decrease with the use of Nysis or Soundex is still present. So I want to talk just for a moment about what do we think is going on here. And if you remember that this um, parameter pi hat, um, so going back to your basic econometrics, you can think about rewriting this parameter as a variance weighted um, uh, uh, share um, a variance weighted estimates for the, for the within and the between variation. And then further you can decompose the within variation for the group of links that are linked correctly. Here I'm denoting that with a star and those that are, we can call them imputed or incorrect with superscript I. And then there's this between component which I think of as the selection component which in a lot of context goes away. But we write it here. So what this means is that the probability limit for our pi hat using a particular method M is going to be a variance weighted share of these d three different um, parameters. And the one that we're particularly interested in is the PLM of those imputed links. So is that zero? Well, obviously that's going to matter a lot or is it big? And I think that this is really when the statisticians say you should do probability weighting and you should include these links. They have some, they're making some assumptions about what that thing should converge to. Um, so let's think about a very simple measurement error process. Let's say that the DADs, when the DADs incomes are incorrect, this is the imputed link. So we're going to get the right income for the correct link and we're going to assume that the only source of measurement here is just that we've used the wrong DAD for you. Um, but that that DAD's income that we observe for you is going to be correlated with your true income, right? And so when we impose the other assumptions of the standard um, errors and variables model, we know, actually know what the probability limit of that component will end up being. It's going to be attenuated um, um, and the attenuation is going to be proportional to the ratio of the signal to noise ratio which we think is going to be less than one. Okay, so what that tells us is that if you plug that in there that that's going to make that PLM too small and that's going to lead to this attenuation. Now if you have class, a uh, non-classical measurement error here, we know it's much harder to sign, right? This could be too big, too small, so it can do all sorts of other things to estimate, but think about, so this is really what we're focusing on. So the two things that are going to be important to assessing how important this is, is one, how many of those links are really imputed, the variance share, right, attributable to those imputed links, times that probability limit. So those two things. So when you have a lot of those links, a lot of your sample is imputed incorrectly, this is going to matter more, and it's going to matter less when it's not. You can think about the other type of thing. This is a very similar example where you could think about, so for if you have unique links, you can think about those, those dad's incomes being measured correctly. But for the multiple links, um, you're just going to observe a log income of some person J, right? And so you can weight a variety, you can weight all of them up by sort of one over the probability of observing them or you could randomly select. But here we're going to have exactly the same type of thing. Um, those aren't the same thetas that are up there in the slides, but the idea is exactly the same as, as the logic I presented before. You're going to get a variance weighted average of the true parameter and this, this um, uh, psi here. And that psi is going to be a function of the covariance of those ties with the true link. So if when you draw from those ties, those John Smiths and the John Smiths 
income, dad, uh, so their, their dads have nothing in common with the dad for the true link, that means psi is gonna be zero and, and you're only going to be, right? So it's as good as zero, it's as good as a random draw. So that's gonna really lead to a lot of attenuation, especially because in the case of multiples, most of the variation here is coming from all of the bad links, right? When you have 10 people and you randomly draw one, you're gonna be wrong nine of 10 times, right? So that's, that is exactly what's going into that second um, theta. So that's really important. So really what the nice thing in our context here is because we have a truth data set, we can look to see what the relationship is for these imputed links and the true links and just compare them. So I can show you. And that's what we'll do now. So this is the wage income for the imputed, uh, for the correct links. And the key thing up there at the top is once we remove the incorrect links from those intergenerational mobility estimates, I found it kind of remarkable, given that these samples are so different, how similar all of those estimates are. So the differences across the method in the intergenerational earnings elasticity in this, so here, appears to be driven by differences in link errors. The other thing is, so we know about the incidence of link errors, but now I'm showing you how correlated the imputed links are uh, so with the true father's income. And that's what you see those little X's are underneath. Now a couple of things, so these over here, where you're looking at sort of random selection using sound X, it looks almost as good as random. There's almost no correlation between um, the dad's income for the imputed links and the true dad's income. But you look over at some of the other ones, they're slightly higher for the uncommon name sample, which is consistent with there being some really important information content in those unusual names, the price fish facts of the world. Now, the other thing I wanna note here is look at that. So I showed you before that there was roughly a 37% type one error rate using this regression-based classification system. But even though those links weren't the ones chosen by hum humans, they're, so whatever it is about them, but they're very correlated, right? Even though they're wrong, dad's income is very correlated with the true dad's income, right? So it's leading to substantially less attenuation in other, other cases. So I think one of the interesting things here is saying, so what is going on in, those re in this regression model that is allowing us to classify things much better than we are doing when we're using these other um, algorithms. So let me sum up. So one, I've shown you a few things. One, the type one error rates in historical linked data look very, very large um, using things like common names, phonetic name cleaning, and tie breaks. We have probabilistic linking or random selection um, really can make things um, a lot worse. One of the things I haven't shown you that we document in the paper is that the false links aren't rep representative of the linked population, which suggests that there may be some difficult to correct measurement error in some of these. Um, but I've also shown you that just errors, errors in themselves don't always matter as much as we might expect. Um, and I think this was part of Joe's point. Um, so he set this up nicely. Um, imputed links don't all have the same effect on inference. So this can vary wildly across in, um, different problems and contexts. The other thing is that we're missing a lot of links, at least 50%, um, except in genealogical samples are just not linked. Um, and the links we know that we are getting are not represented uh, representative of the underlying population. I haven't showed you evidence on that either, but that turns out to be the case in every sample that we've shown, or that we, we've studied. So the combined effects of both these type one and type two errors, and here I would say it looks like predominantly type one error, can attenuate estimates of intergenerational income elasticities by more than 50%. Okay. So now comes to, so what are we gonna do about this? I wrote a few things that we've been working on, and I know, so the high cost thing is everyone should just link their own data by hand, but that's not what I'm gonna recommend. It's cost prohibitive, I don't think we can do it. So a few simple things we can do. One, using NISIS and Soundex does not look like a particularly good idea, especially when we have a lot more sophisticated algorithms for searching and doing the matching. Second, using uncommon name samples and machine learning techniques seems to 
buy you a lot in this context, even the simplest machine learning techniques like regression-based methods that should be very easy for um, economic historians to adopt. Um, the other thing I want to say is we have coded up as part of this project a lot of do files to implement all of these algorithms which we're making available with a paper. And here's one of the cool things we've discovered. So all of these algorithms, it's not that they're getting things wrong in all of the same ways. They get things wrong in really different ways, which turns out to be really, really useful. So you, if you look at the links that are common to all of the algorithms, you can, one, diagnose a lot of problematic cases and errors, um, and you can also do a lot um, to learn more about what may be going wrong with your algorithm. So that's cheap. You can do it in your computer in the afternoon. We also have done in some simulations, and, and I will say this is pretty preliminary, but because these algorithms get things wrong in so many different ways, in fact, combining them and taking the set of common links can get us down to error rates that look like ground truth data. I would say sort of in the 4 to 6 percent range. So I think that that's a really hopeful thing. Two, um, I, and I think this is common practice, so I don't think we need to spend too much time on it. When available, we can use a lot more record features. They don't need to be economic outcomes like home ownership or education or wages to weight up our records. We can use a lot of other information that's in names, in ages, um, to, to think about how we can reweight the data. And finally, what do we do about those small subsamples? What I've recommended here isn't going to increase our ability to study certain small groups. We need those higher match rates to do a lot better job trying to learn about these smaller groups in the population. And my last recommendation is for historians to do what um, I think we have always done best, is really hard work in archives, genealogy is working through the primary records, pulling in the information that we can get when we do this type of intensive hand linking to help inform the machine models then that we can use to train the data.